Now we'll go on and we'll talk about bedding and especially disrupted bedding. Sometimes you can see very strange things and if you don't have a um, an idea of what might cause it, you're just going to see broken, disrupted chaos. Um, but oftentimes it's a very specific structure. Now here we talk about load casts. We also call them ball and pillow structures and you might see why from the little illustration here because oftentimes little balls and pillow like blobs are what you see and you're going to be looking at say some mud and see big sandy blobs in it and you're going to ask yourself how did those blobs get there uh, I think when you look at even this goofy cartoon I've drawn you can get a really good idea this is a density difference issue and you've got a denser sand on a weaker or a less dense mud and it's an unstable condition. So all you're waiting for is some little disruption, some storm, some earthquake, some seismic event, and blobs of that heavy sand are going to start to sink into the layer beneath. And you can think of that if you've got oil and water in a cup and they've separated. If you shake it up, they start to mix together. But with uh, rock, it's not going to come back to that equilibrium separation uh, the same way that it would have with your oil and water. Now when you've got layers of sand and mud buried, the mud tends to consolidate before the sand. Um, so you squeeze the water out and consolidate together, but the water in the sandy layers just gets under higher and higher pressure when that happens around it because you're all buried, the water leaves this muddy layer, where's it going to go? It's going to go into your porous sand and create a high water pressure um, because it doesn't have anywhere to escape. So when you've got those sands, those unconsolidated sands around those muds in that high pressure, cracks can form in the mud and sand and the water under pressure will shoot up through those cracks. And you can see that in the lower picture here. You've got that dense sand that high pressure, that mud that is consolidated and so it's going to crack instead of just kind of ooze away and boom you have a clastic dike as it's full of clasts so that terminology makes sense. You can have a little sand volcano if it were to break through to the surface and uh, just pops up interesting looking little volcanoes and this gives you an idea of where those little mounds come from this can also happen with conglomerate. It doesn't have to be a sand, but the point is that it's still unconsolidated, still able to flow that way, and it's about all that extra water entering it and creating a high pressure environment. Now, uh, we get back to our sort of main topic of disrupted bedding. Sometimes when this happens, it's not as neat as this little plastic dike and this little mound of sand. Sometimes it just breaks up the bedding around it. And when that happens, you simply call it disrupted bedding. Uh, the bedding has been disrupted. So that makes a lot of sense. So we talk a lot about these density differences and these pressure differences. We're going we're gonna to come back to this again in this lesson and in later lessons. Now, we're going to go back to terms we've been hearing since our very first geology co course. But if you're anything like me, you get these confused uh, at the odd time. <laughs> so we'll talk about them again briefly. We've got different types of contacts. Now there's actually more than what is depicted here, but these are the main ones. And then you get into finer terminology when you want to get um, into sort of finer situations. But basically you have your non-conformity. There's no conformity at all because you have bedded sedimentary layers on top of basement crystalline rocks. Um, these could be metamorphic, igneous, whatever, but these are basement rocks. So there's no conformity. You can't really talk about the time between the one rock and the other. So we call it a non-conformity. A disconformity is the most basic kind of contra contact. It's just a time difference. You have an eroded uh, or arrested surface between an older and a much younger bed where nothing was deposited or what was deposited has been eroded away and so the time is not recorded at that interval and we call that a disconformity and sometimes a disconformity is called a paraconformity when it is not obvious um, and so you have to use finer techniques to see that there is a 
an interval missing there. You're going to have to do fossil work or whatever else, and that's a paraconformity. An angular unconformity is pretty self-explanatory, but you've got an eroded bed that's been upturned or it's been compacted or folded and then eroded away and new horizontal layers are laid over it. Of course, by the time you look at them, they may not be horizontal anymore, but they were horizontal to the surface that was eroded. Now you've got a buttress or an on-lap unconf on unconformity over here, and let's just think about the ocean floor. Although a lot of the abyssal plains are flat, you have sea mounts and other topography there. So imagine that these sedimentary layers are being laid around a sort of non-planar topography. So you've got a contact between those layers and what was already there that is not horizontal. And so that's what you call a buttress unconformity or an on-lamp unconformity. Um, so we can move on from our types of contacts to the next slide and talk about contact indicators because contacts are not obvi always obvious like we talked about with the para conformity. Now sometimes you can see channeling. Channeling is an obvious way. It's an indicator that a riverbed has run through a sedimentary environment which is going to tell you that probably a substantial amount of sediment has been removed by the river, has been eroded away, and it's a good place to mark a contact, and you can kind of move out from there. You can see basal conglomerates, and basal conglomerates are big, clastic, messy, kind of um, poorly sorted rock and debris at uh, some random place in your beds. Now, since you don't expect that kind of... Uh, sediment environment in a continuous, say, submarine uh, sedimentary uh, unit, you can expect that there has been big changes between the lower unit and what that basal conglomerate marks. And so that's a good place to look for a contact. And then obviously you have time discordance. If you're working with fossils, if you're working with um, any kind of time dating, you can see that even if it is a, apparently continuous, if there's a large time discordance, then that's a good place to mark contact. Um, and one more really uh, helpful indicator is an oxidized paleosol. Why? Uh, because if it has been exposed long enough to oxidize and become a soil, that's what a paleosol is, that's an ancient soil, then you know that sediment was probably not being continuously deposited there. That was an open plain or marsh environment, whatever it was. Um, you can expect that there was a time when it existed as a soil that it was being eroded away, number one, and number two, that there is um, time missing in the record there. So those are important contact indicators. Now, there's more. There's more contact indicators, but uh, We'll have to talk about them at a later date. You kind of run across them in various categories. Now we'll talk about compaction and diagenetic structures. Diagenetic means that these are structures that are associated with the genesis of the rock. Now, compaction, like we talked about earlier, is basically, you know, a pressure exerted by forces. Usually, this is a gravity pressure. Uh, compaction comes from above. As sediment is deposited, you create a heavy overburden, and that drives the lithification of the rock beneath it, as does depth and temperature. Now you can see here these pinch and swell structures. Now here's an area where you're going to have to be very careful because pinch and swell structures are an important tectonic indicator of tensile and compressional stress. And I don't mean gravity-driven compressional stress like we're looking at here. This that, that we see in this little illustration I've drawn here is a pinch and swell structure due to differential stress in the overburden. And that means that maybe there's a little extra weight right here on the surface or extra water being held in the, the layers above this area or any number of things that's, that is creating a differential stress. And because there's just a little more weight here, the sand will sink, it'll fill in, it's already heavier and denser than say this little mud we've got beneath it. And so it starts to push away this um, weaker layer and pinch and swell. See? Pinch swell. But we're going to have to be able to differentiate this from high pressure environments where we see other pinch and swell. Um, we'll talk about that later, but it's just important to know that 
the same kind of structure can be due to very, very different things. Um, then we've got stylolites, which are interesting little toothy, clay-filled, um, they're not, oh, let's, let's go this way. Stylolites are not structural fractures. They're serrate surfaces where mineral material has been removed by pressure dissolution. Okay, so you've got this compaction and dissolution due to the high pressure environment and soluble minerals leave, but clay not being soluble is what stays. So stylolites create these little clay tooth. Um, they're pretty common in homogeneous rocks, carbonates, cherts, and sandstones, but you can find them in certain igneous rocks. Um, they're usually, the, the stylolites themselves are usually parallel to the bedding because the pressure is usually from the overburden, but since they can be related by some angle to the bedding, we don't want to, we don't want to make that a law because it, it depends where the pressure is coming from, and especially as the bedding may be deformed or turned over. Now, you've also got another interesting little feature called lice gang banding. These are like colored compositional rings or bands in a fluid saturated rock and it's due to the rhythmic precipitation under compaction. So impurities are dissolved and differentiated um, because, you know, when you've got a situation where things become uh, partially, well, they, they're partially in solution, you know, they, they like to differentiate. We're going to see that a lot. Um, and reactions take place which cause the separation of these alternating oxidized and reduced iron in some cases or just the separation of, of different sort of elemental properties and, and compositions. And these bands are often not parallel to your bedding and so you have to be able to recognize them because they are so tempting to see as bedding but so not necessarily related to bedding because dissolution, depending on where your, your pressure is coming from that, that may be driving it, does not have to be parallel to bedding, especially if your beds have been moved over time and are no longer horizontal because even dissolution due to your compaction pressure isn't going to be parallel to your bedding. Um, so we've got that here. We have, we have stress that causes facility and we usually see fissile behavior in our shales. We've got a lot of muds that do that. Um, and these fissile uh, little layers or plates often have planes of parting. So we need to know what we're talking about when we talk about a fissile shale as opposed to a better consolidated one. Uh, the, the more fissile it is, the more you can pop it apart into little tiny plates that are parallel to each other. And so that's some of the terminology we're going to use.